What's up guys, Dr. Gooden here to talk about neural adaptations to anaerobic training programs, coming up. When we're talking about anaerobic training programs, we are referring to plyometric training, resistance training, sprint training, anything that's high enough intensity to be well over the VO2 max of an athlete. And there's a variety of adaptations that are similar across all these different styles of training as long as they're anaerobic in nature. So let's take a look. Okay, this comes from the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning by Hoff and Triplett. This chapter was written by Dr. Duncan French. Now the first key term to define is anaerobic training. Now in the intro, I described some different types of, of anaerobic training. And really, any type of anaerobic training has to be of sufficiently high intensity, and it's typically involving intermittent bounce, bouts, so some sort of interval training, such as weight training, which is technically interval training if you think about it. When you do a set, let's say you do a set of 10, and then you rest, and then you do another set of 10, those are really two intervals that you are completing. So weight training is interval training. Plyometric drills, speed training, agility training, and some forms of interval training. Now, not all forms of interval training are anaerobic. Of course, you have to be above the lactate threshold, above your VO2 max, for them to really be considered anaerobic style training. So the duration of these intervals needs to be quite a bit shorter than a minute for it to be truly considered anaerobic training. Now in this video we're going to cover the neural adaptations and there are many neural adaptations that come along with anaerobic style training. Now these adaptations occur all along the neuromuscular chain. The neuromuscular chain refers to your central nervous system starting at the brain and then going down the spinal cord all the way out to the peripheral nervous system into the neuromuscular junction. So we see adaptations at all of these levels from the higher brain centers down even to the individual muscle fibers themselves. Now here are some potential sites of adaptation within the neuromuscular system. So we have the brain, the descending corticospinal tracts, down your spinal cord. We have adaptations to reflexes. So the GTO reflex, also the myotatic reflex. The myotatic reflex is also called the stretch reflex. We also even have changes in the individual muscle fibers themselves. These changes though are going to be muscular and we will talk about those in another video. But here we have changes at the neuromuscular junction. So we see multiple sites of neural adaptation. Now let's go through these one at a time. Central adaptation, so adaptations to the central nervous system include motor cortex activity increases. The motor cortex activity increases when the level of force developed increases and when new exercises are, or movements are being learned. So really what this is saying is that the greater the force output of the, of the exercise, so if you go from a goblet squat to a barbell back squat, now there's a force output increase because of that exercise, you now get greater activation of the motor cortex. Likewise, if you're learning the back squat for the first time, let's say you're graduating from a goblet squat, you've mastered that, and the strength coach has determined that you can safely back squat, well, you are still learning a new movement even though it's the same movement pattern. It's a new exercise, and so your motor cortex activity will actually increase as you learn that new skill. There are also changes, the strengthening of synapses, the myelination of axons that takes place in those descending corticospinal tracts. Now, moving out from the central nervous system, we also have adaptations of the individual motor units. So maximal strength and power increases of agonist muscles result from a combination of increase in recruitment, rate of firing, remember that's called rate coding, synchronization of firing, or a combination of all of these factors. 
So we've talked in previous videos about the neural versus the muscular adaptations to training. And specifically here, we're talking about the recruitment, the synchronous recruitment of motor units. So how many of those motor units can we recruit at one time to generate force synchronously? Also, how fast are those alpha motor neurons sending off action potentials? And that's referred to as rate coding. And then finally, are we able to recruit those higher threshold motor units? Now there's a principle we have to talk about called the size principle or Henneman's size principle. And it states that with heavy resistance training, all muscle fibers get larger. And that is because motor units are recruited in a sequential order by their size to produce high levels of force. So we see that with weight training, it's not just those type two fast twitch, high force production muscle fibers that get bigger. It's not like we shut off our type one slow twitch fibers when we go to lift a heavy weight. In fact, we begin recruiting those slow twitch muscle fibers first. They engage first because they have the lower activation threshold. As that activation threshold is crossed and we require more and more force to move the weight or to move the load, then those higher threshold motor units, the type 2A and type 2X fibers become activated. And this is what's referred to as the size principle. We'll see a graph on that in a second. But in advanced lifters, the central nervous system may adapt to allow recruitment in a non-consecutive order by recruiting larger motor units first to promote greater power or speed in a movement. So here's a graph of the size principle and each of these circles represents a motor unit. You can assume that a larger circle like this one represents a larger motor unit or a motor unit with a greater activation threshold. And then down here, these motor units have a lower activation or recruitment threshold. So the green would be type one muscle fibers and the yellow would be type two muscle fibers. And remember that all of the muscle fibers activated by an individual motor unit are of the same type. So we've seen that in animal studies, actually, if you change the alpha motor neuron, let's say you move a faster twitch alpha motor neuron to a slower twitch set of muscle fibers, we actually get some conversion of those fiber types, okay? So the alpha motor neuron really helps to determine the fiber type of the muscle fibers. So anyways, these circles represent the size and the threshold of the motor unit in question. And we see that as force production increases, now this way, the recruitment threshold of these motor units also increases up here. So as the force production is low, you can really be using these primarily type one fibers. But as you require more and more force, then we really have to call upon these bigger and higher threshold motor units. Now this happens very quickly. It's not like it, this is over the course of minutes or even seconds, it's over the course of milliseconds. Now with anaerobic training, especially things like plyometric training or with contrast sets where we might do a heavy strength movement followed by a ballistic or plyometric movement, all, this is also called post-activation potentiation, we might see a non-consecutive recruitment of motor units. So in strength trained individuals, there's evidence to show that they can actually recruit those higher threshold motor units first without having to first activate the lower threshold motor units. And what that does is that just increases the rate of force development that they can generate during a movement. Now at the neuromuscular junction, there are many possible changes. The first could be an increase in the total area of the neuromuscular junction. So now more acetylcholine can pass between the alpha motor neuron and the muscle cell. We have more dispersed and irregularly shaped synapses and a greater total length of nerve terminal branching. So again, just more area for acetylcholine to pass into the cell to generate an action potential and increased end plate perimeter length and area, as well as greater dispersion of acetylcholine receptors within the end plate region. So these neuromuscular junction adaptations, really they just serve to enhance the connection or the coupling between the nerve and the muscle cell so that more acetylcholine can pass and diffuse more quickly and be received more readily by the muscle cell. We also have improvement in the neuromuscular reflexes. For instance, we know that the myotatic or stretch reflex enhances the activation of the agonist muscle. So here in this picture, we have the quadriceps muscle as the agonist. We see that if we give a little tendon tap, 
to the patellar tendon, that rapid stretch of the muscle spindles sends a signal up the afferent nerve coming off of the muscle spindle, which synapses with the alpha motor neuron to send a signal back to the quads to contract. Now, the reason why this myotatic or stretch reflex is so beneficial in improving athletic movements is because it doesn't have to move from conscious thought to your motor cortex and then go all the way down your spinal cord. It just synapses with the spinal cord and then right back to the muscle and it's automatic. So we can actually increase the magnitude and rate of force development by enhancing the myotatic reflex response. We've also examined the impact of anaerobic training on EMG or electromyography. EMG is just a way of measuring the electrical signal to the muscles. So an increase in EMG means an increase usually in neural activation. So studies have shown strength and power increases of up to 70% or 73%. And we know that advancement in training contributes to even further gains in strength and power. And furthermore, this is really interesting, dramatic increases in neural adaptations usually take place very early in the program. So if you start an athlete strength training and they've never strength trained before, those in those first weeks, he or she will make dramatic gains in strength and power, but without concurrent gains in muscle size. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is this or how is this athlete stronger, but there is not any more muscle tissue, not more muscle mass, at least that we can discern reliably. And it's because of this increase in the neural factors of strength. So increases in rate coding, in synchronous activation of motor units, in the ability to recruit high threshold motor units, and even in central factors, right, coming from the higher orders of the brain and in the descending cortical spinal tracts, all of these together will lead to much greater force improvements in those first weeks than improvements in muscle size ever will. It actually takes the muscular system several weeks to catch up, so to speak, to the neural system as far as adaptations to anaerobic training. So changes in muscle takes a while, but changes to the neural system or the nervous system, that happens fairly quickly on a scale of just one to several days and your nervous system is adapting. It's that plastic in nature. Now, some other interesting things that have come out of EMG studies, there is a concept of cross-education. So cross-education is where if you train one side of your body, the other side also reaps some of the benefit, at least some of the neural benefits, not the muscular benefits, because the muscle fibers on that untrained side are not experiencing increased mechanical tension or the metabolic byproducts of the work that's being done on the trained side. But in your body's effort to stay symmetrical, and because some of those neural factors are central factors, not peripheral factors, there is some cross-education happening. So we can see that if you train just the right side and say bicep curls, and you don't train the left side. So maybe we measure the peak voluntary contraction on the left side pre and post. We actually see an increase on the untrained side. And so that's called cross education. We also have what's called the bilateral deficit in untrained individuals. And the bilateral deficit is this phenomena where an individual is stronger unilaterally than they are bilaterally in the sense that let's say that you do a single leg lunge on the right side and then on the left side, and then you add the load together, right? The, the sum of what you could lift on the right side and the sum of what you could lift on the left side, and then you try to back squat that much. And theoretically, if you could single leg squat a certain load, you should be able to double leg squat that load times two, right? Because you have two legs, okay? So we actually find that in untrained individuals, if we single leg squat them, and then we double leg squat them, they cannot match their single leg squat times two on the back squat. But theoretically, because you have two legs, you should be able to do that. The reason is, is because neural factors are actually inhibiting it. They're diminishing the output of their muscles in order to guard or protect the body because the body's not used to what it's experiencing. It's not used to that extra load, especially in an axial load, like in a back squat. And so the body will actually govern or limit the strength output. But with training, we can actually start to take that governor off. And so in trained individuals, they can often squat with two legs much more than twice what they can squat with just one leg. And we also see changes in the antagonist activity during agonist movements. So this would be a decrease in the co-contraction of muscles around the joint. So let's say in a jumping movement where you want to rapidly extend 
at the hip and at the knee, your hamstrings, are, which are the antagonists because they would flex the knee, uh, they might be overly active. And so you're trying to you know, go through this rapid knee extension, but the antagonist is co-contracting and there's some activation there. Well, through resistance training, through anaerobic training like plyometrics, et cetera, we can actually decrease the activation of the antagonist muscle so that it's no longer slowing down or impeding the agonist muscle. So that wraps up the neural adaptations to anaerobic training programs. The key takeaway here is that there are a number of sites of adaptation all along the neural chain from the higher orders of the brain all the way down to the neuromuscular junction. And because of the plasticity of the nervous system, these changes can begin to take place in as little as a week. So really those first four weeks or so of strength increases when you start a new program or you start training anaerobically and you haven't been previously, those first four weeks of strength gains and power gains, those are going to be almost 100% due to changes in the neural system. So if you guys have any questions, let me know down in the comments and I'd love to engage with you down there. Otherwise, stick around for the next video which will cover the muscular adaptations to anaerobic training programs. All right guys, it was great talking to you and I'll see you all on the next video. Hey kiddos, if you can just try to whisper that would be great to me. I'm, I'm trying to tell you that, okay? Okay. So here's a graph of the size principle.